six seconds really nice all right here. Howdy, everybody. Hi. Hey. I already did, Mike. I'm a pro. <laughs> good afternoon. I hope everybody's having a good time. Hope everybody's digested a little bit. It's nice to go with the slot after the slot after lunch slot. Uh, welcome. This is opening the black box, uh, becoming a better developer through debugging. If that's not what you're looking for, you're in the wrong place. Um, as I said, howdy. My name is Dustin Yance. I am at Mills Yobtaf basically everywhere on the internet, except for Yahoo, and I'm still mad about that. Um, I'm an engineer at Acquia. Uh, we're a small hosting company based out of Boston. Maybe you've heard of us. Um, and you don't have to worry about taking notes if you don't feel like it, uh, because this presentation uh, is going to be up on my GitHub immediately after this in PDF form. Um, at the very end of the talk, there is a slide that's nothing but links. Um, so check that out uh, if you want to see some of the books that I, I picked some things up from. Um, so I guess the, the big question, the $64,000 question, what is debugging? Um, that's kind of what we're going we're gonna to unravel throughout this talk. Um, so just a little icebreaker. Uh, there's a, a new product called Glitch. Uh, it's a, it's a Node.js in the browser platform. It's pretty cool. Uh, and they went on Twitter and they asked, um, what's the worst thing that you've ever broken? I think it's a, it's a pretty great question. Um, one of my coworkers likes to use it whenever he's interviewing somebody at work. Um, and they put out theirs. My code once took down a client's intranet mid-demo. That's pretty bad. Um, this guy, Zach Holman, if you don't recognize the name, he was one of the original hires at GitHub. He wrote most of their early code. Uh, and he once shipped GitHub to production in development mode. <laughs> Seems like that might have caused some problems. Uh, Jen Schiffer, she's a, a JavaScript developer. She used to work for the MBA, like the actual uh, web team for the MBA. And she once took down the entire Chinese MBA site while switching the nets uh, from their old city to their new city. Uh, this is my all-time favorite. Um, my first client patch caused all their W-2s to print with the deceased box checked. It was a nunnery. I killed an entire nunnery. So good. Uh, mine pales in comparison. Uh, I used to work at the University of Texas Libraries, and on the first day back from holiday break, um, I took down the entire library website um, when I transferred HT access over FTP, and for some reason, my FTP client truncated the first two characters of the file. Uh, turns out those are very important characters. <laughs> Apache really cares about those. Uh, I thought I had broken some really bad stuff, uh, and I sat down with one of our sysadmins, and we're looking at the history, and he's like, oh, no, it's just two characters. We can fix that. I was like, oh, thank goodness. I, I don't need to be fired just yet. <laughs> Uh, this is better than finals week, that's for sure. So, what is debugging? This might be something that you're familiar with if you've used Drupal for any amount of time. Um, what if you are presented with a page on your website that's nothing but text? Uh, what kind of problems might cause this issue? Um, probably a very common one. The CSS, uh, you have aggregation turned on, uh, but it's not cached properly. Uh, maybe you pulled the database from production to local, um, something like that. It's pretty, pretty common. Uh, maybe for some reason uh, JavaScript is blocked in the browser that somebody's trying to view this in. I think this used to be more of an edge case, uh, but nowadays more and more people are using stuff like Ghostery or OneBlocker um, to knock out the, the tracking scripts that a lot of pages are injecting. Uh, and if you're not careful, uh, it can break your entire site in that way. Um, I've noticed, personally, there are a lot of sites that use Google Tag Manager to manage not only their advertising and marketing scripts, but they'll also put their site scripts into that. Um, and so if I'm blocking that, then the entire site drops. Um, and that's not good, but I'm used to that now, and I know where to look. Um, and of course, our personal favorite, uh, file permissions and site's default files. This is a really common thing where that, you know, a lot of times when you're moving things around with Git, permissions get flipped. Um, and all of a sudden, Drupal can't write to that directory. Um, and you're not going to get any of your CSS or your JavaScript, sometimes your, your images. Um, so what I, what I realized when I was putting together this talk is I think there's a difference between debugging and troubleshooting. 
Um, it's kind of maybe it's an academic difference, maybe it's a semantic difference. Uh, but in my mind, did it take five minutes to correct, or did it take five hours? That might be a good rule. Um, more importantly, did you fix the problem, or did you understand the problem and correct it? Um, a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll see something and we'll want to fix it really quick. But we don't understand why it happened in the first place, and that just leaves the door open for this to occur again in the future. So, what is this black box we're talking about? Uh, let me tell you a little story, see if it sounds at all familiar. Uh, I personally have a non-technical education. Um, I have a philosophy, uh, sorry, I have a psychology degree. I have a film degree. And then just for fun, I went back and got another film degree. Which means uh, I have largely self-taught web skills. Um, I got into this whole thing because I was working in film, and everybody around, it, around me wanted a website. And I was like, oh, I could probably do that. And, you know, for beer money, for 50 bucks here, 50 bucks there, I figured out how to make websites. And, of course, I have pretty above average Googling abilities. Uh, I might put myself like top 100 in the world, <laughs> not to brag. Um, but I still spend a lot of late nights staring at error messages. Probably sounds pretty familiar to a lot of y'all. Um, so what is, what is Drupal? This is the black box that we're focused on right now. Um, I gave this talk at a PHP conference this week. I got a lot of dirty looks when this slide came up. Uh, but that's okay. They have opinions. Um, when you're, you know, when you're working on something, it can be helpful to kind of put together a mental model of that thing. Um, get a, get a visual in your head, even if it's something abstract, like web software. And I think originally, early on, and for many years after, this was my mental model of Drupal. <laughs> Just an impenetrable black monolith. I knew that it did stuff. I knew that I could put stuff into it and I could get stuff out of it. Um, but I didn't really understand how it was happening. It was just this thing sitting in the corner making stuff work. Um, after a while, you know, a couple of years in, I started really understanding Drupal at what I thought was a pretty deep level, and uh, my mental model shifted. And so now I had a, a status light on top, and I could recognize Drupal by sight. That's pretty good. Um, but still, it's very much an impenetrable black monolith. Uh, we're going to sidetrack for a second. I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite childhood books. It says Maniac McGee. Has anybody read this? Jerry Spinelli. I think it came out in 1992. Mike's raising his hand. Um, this is the story of a, a boy, uh, the titular Maniac McGee, who lives in a small town in uh, Pennsylvania, and he has the preternatural ability to untangle knots. Um, kids from counties around come to him if they have a yo-yo knot or a <laughs> knot in their shoelace, and he's the one that can always fix it. He's just really good at it. So there is a store in town that sells, uh, you know, it's kind of a general store, and they sell pizza. And out front, they have a flagpole. And it hasn't had a flag on it in a long time. It's just kind of sitting there. And the rope on the flagpole over time becomes knotted, just kind of balls up on itself. And it's described in the book as the biggest, gnarliest, grossest knot you've ever seen, the size of a child's head. And the owner of the store, uh, Cobble, decides that he wants to put together a contest. And whomever can untangle this knot wins free pizza for an entire year. And, you know, when you're a kid, I, I probably would take a year's worth of pizza over a million dollars. Like, the pizza is much more concrete. So the kids in the town, they tell Maniac about this. They're like, this is, you're the greatest knot untangler that has ever lived. You should totally take down this knot, and then we get free pizza for a year. And he's like, yeah, sure, I'll give it a try. And so he goes out there, and next to the, next to the flagpole is a picnic table. And there's a crowd of kids from all around, like you know, dozens and dozens of kids cheering him on. They think he's going to walk up to it, snap his fingers like Fonzie, and it's going to fall apart. But instead what happens is he sits down at the picnic table, and he just looks at the knot. And he just sits there for an entire day until the sun goes down, just staring at this knot. He doesn't touch it. And the kids slowly kind of get bored, and they start drifting away, and finally it's just him sitting there looking at this knot. 
Um, eventually, he goes home. The next day, he comes back, and a couple of kids show up because they hear he's going to be there, but everybody's kind of bored by this point. But now, Maniac walks up to this knot, and he starts poking at it, and he starts tugging at some of the strings, and again, he spends the entire day just poking and tugging and just doing these small little things until finally the knot comes apart. He's, he's come to understand this knot, and he's able to untangle it. Now, Dustin, why are you talking about rope in a kid's book? This is Drupal 7. This is the bootstrap process um, of one of the theme functions, uh, one of many. Uh, this is just a small part. This is uh, kind of what it looks like in Drupal 8. So these are, these are very complex things. This, this is, you know, <coughs> Drupal is the work of hundreds and thousands of people over dozens of years. It's not a thing that's easy for a single person to comprehend from beginning to end. But that's okay. We don't have to understand all of it. What we have to do is we have to start at the beginning. Um, we need to first understand our tool set. As any good craftspeople, we need to know what we're using, how to use it, um, and when to pull out the appropriate tool. Because when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So, first thing we want to think about, text editors. This is the first place uh, that any of us do any work. Um, it's how we make our, make our living. And there's kind of three levels of text editors. Um, I call them text editors and quotes, text editors, and IDEs, or integrated development environments. Um, text editors and quotes. These are things like Notepad, um, Text Edit, Nano. Um, these are very basic, very bare bones. Um, who here started their career in Notepad? All right. Okay. Um, at the time, okay, who started in Text Edit? Nano. All right, we got a Nano in the back. That's great. So these are these are very basic. It's black text on a white background. You're not going to have color syntax highlighting. You're not going to have auto indenting. Uh, but in a scrape, they work. Um, you know, a lot of people have made a lot of websites using nothing but one of these three tools. Um, when, we, when we move up in, in the, the food chain, we get to text editors. Um, these are things like Notepad++, uh, Dreamweaver, believe it or not, Sublime Text, Atom, I never thought I would say this, Microsoft VS Code, uh, or Vim. Um, so these are more fully featured um, I think the, the primary uh, characteristic of these is the fact that you can install plugins. You can customize them in uh, pretty, pretty fun ways. Um, Dreamweaver, I like to stick that one in there. Uh, like I said, I used to work at a university, and if you've ever worked at a university or a large institution, um, you know they're really weird about what they'll spend money on and what they'll let you install on your computer. Um, so I spend some time at the university uh, where they wouldn't let me uh, buy any other software. I couldn't <coughs> buy PHP Storm, um, and they wouldn't let me install anything, so I couldn't install Sublime Text. Uh, but they already had an incredibly expensive site license for all the Adobe software, and I could install it just by clicking a button, so I did. And once you turn all of the, all of the you know, kind of auto-complete, uh, let-me-do-it-for-you things that Dreamweaver tries to do, all the, all the weird little WYSIWYG widgets, uh, it's a pretty serviceable text editor. Um, you can change your syntax scheme, get the colors that you like. Um, you can install some plugins. It's you know it's not great, but it works. Um, Sublime Text and Atom are you know kind of the the de facto nowadays uh, in this realm. Uh, Microsoft VS Code is making a really strong showing. Um, it's doing some really cool stuff, and it's available across all three major platforms: Mac, Linux, and Windows. Um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, and then there's Vim. Uh, I think it's technically available on literally anything. You can probably get it on a, on a Casio watch if you want, uh, but it's easiest to use if you uh, have a Mac or you're on Linux. Um, and again, you can install so many plugins. Like it's really using on Windows. Yeah. yeah. Just is it straight like GVM or. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, so these are these are things that you know it's kind of it kind of lets you level up. This is where a lot of professionals will spend a lot or most of their career. Uh, and you can get some really good stuff done. No Emacs? What? You're, you're, <laughs> ruining, you're ruining my joke. Oh, sorry. 
Um, next up the chain, uh, integrated development environments. Um, these are things like uh, PHP Storm, um, Eclipse, or Komodo. Um, I personally uh, only ever use PHP Storm for web development. Uh, I put the other two on here because they have been yelled at me uh, previously when I've given this talk. Um, the primary characteristic of an IDE is generally that it's tuned for a specific type of programming. Um, so it's not as general purpose as a text editor would be. It's going to have some decisions made for you uh, about what plugins might be pre-installed. Um, PHP Storm, um, it is made by JetBrains, and they have a whole slew of IDEs for various uh, uses, whether you want to do iOS development, Android development, Ruby development. Um, and any of them can be used for anything, but they're kind of pre-tuned in certain ways. Um, and now that they use a, a subscription license, you can get easier access across the board to the different types uh, of products that they have. Um, and these are, you know, this is where you're going to have integrated uh, debugging built in um, because it's going to be pre-tuned for that. It's going to be really nice and easy. Um, and of course, if you're looking for an operating system with the built-in text editor, Emacs. That's my one nerd joke. <laughs> <laughs> I should be all caps. Um, so now that we know what we're going to be uh, what we're going to be editing our code in, uh, we need to think about how our development environment is going to be set up. Like what we're actually going to put the code into to make it to see what it's doing. Uh, we have a couple options. Um, it can be directly on your server. It can be directly on your local machine. Um, or it can be on your local machine, but it's made to act like the actual server that it's going to be on. <coughs> um, so when we're, we're talking about local development, we're talking about FTP development, or when we're talking about on the server, um, also known as cowboy coding, one of my all-time favorite terms. Um, this is where you are you know, logging into a server directly, whether it's uh, production or otherwise, and editing things directly there. No. Um, you've got your local environments. These are things like MAMP or LAMP or Vagrant. Um, Vagrant is uh, it's kind of on the, the edge going into what I consider the kind of the next generation of things. Um, and these are things like Calibox, Lando, uh, various Docker type setups. Uh, as well as you know, like more precisely tuned things like Drupal VM under Vagrant. And now Docker, which is kind of interesting. I've been wanting to try that out. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about FTP development, the cowboy coding? Um, one of the problems you're going to run into here is you're not going to have version control up front, generally, because you're using FTP. You're just taking the raw text files and images and dragging them over the wire onto the server. Um, going back to that story of mine where I uh, accidentally broke a website by truncating the first two characters of a file, um, at the time, the only way we had to access the server was across was SFTP, which is a little bit better than FTP, but not by a lot. Um, and so we would have to you know, pull the files locally, edit them, push them back up to see if it actually worked. Or if we were in a particular rush, we could you know, go directly into the server and edit the files. And you never want to have to do that if you can help it. Um, because you, know, you don't have the version control, you have no way of verifying what is there, what has changed. Um, if we were using version control at the university at that time, I could have quickly seen that those two characters got dropped before I even made the push. Um, you're also going to have little debugging visibility, and this is kind of the more important thing to us. You might have access to the log files, maybe. You'll be, you know, generally be able to put debug statements in, um, like your DSMs or your print Rs. Um, but if you're on the production server, you might not be able to do that because you don't want that kind of information showing up on the production server. Uh, and maybe you have access to the watchdog logs if the permissions on the site are set up properly. Uh, when we're talking about debug statements, these are things like print R, which just kind of gives you a raw dump of a variable or a context without any formatting. Uh, you do something like that, print R node, would give you everything that happened to be in the node variable at that time. Uh, one of my, my quick and dirty tricks when I do have to use this, uh, by default, print R is just going to give you a dump uh, with none of, the, none of the formatting that you might want to see. Uh, and it's going to be generally a lot of information, so it's going to be really hard to parse. Uh, but if you wrap 
your print R statement in pre-tags, it'll at least do some indenting and give you a slightly better way to look at this if and when you have to do this. Um, there's also things like DSM in uh, Drupal 7 or Kint in Drupal 8. And these are going to give you a more nicely formatted dump of that variable. Um, use it in the same way, just call it DSM and then whatever variable you want to put in there. Um, and yeah, so that, that's about the extent of what you're going to get generally when you're working directly with the server. Um, maybe you have local development set up. In this case, we're talking something like MAMP, um, Dev Desktop, or some type of native LAMP. Um, this is you know, pretty common on Macs or on Linux to set up native LAMP. Um, nowadays, you can do it on Windows because you can install Linux inside of Windows, which is another sentence that's very strange to say out loud. Um, and with this, the code is running entirely locally. You're no longer dependent on that server while you're actively working, which is nice. Um, I used to spend, uh, I used to work for a couple of different agencies, spent a lot of time traveling. Uh, and as an added bonus, you get to do generally offline work, which is really nice. Uh, not only do you not need to connect to the server, you can set it up so that you don't even need to connect to the internet at all. Um, and so when you're taking the train from here to New York uh, and you're enjoying that lovely Amtrak Wi-Fi, uh, you don't have to worry about the connection dropping out and you not being able to do something. Um, so that's kind of cool. It's just a side effect. Um, you're going to have access to all the different things like print R, DSM, Kint. But you're also going to have access to more advanced things like xdebug, which is really cool. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute. And then local development, the next generation, um, Calibox, um, Lando. Uh, both of these are general purpose, but they have already built into them specific tooling to work directly with like Pantheon and Acquia hosting, which is really nice. Um, the, the finer uh, point of this is you're able to set up your local environment to not only serve the files, but to behave like the servers that it's going to be hosted on, which is really nice. Um, so you can, you can have a little, bit more, uh, a little bit more faith that what you do locally is going to work. You don't have to worry about, oh, I'm using PHP 5.6.2, not 5.6.4, or something you know, very esoteric like that. Um, it's going to be much more specific. Um, this also applies to like Drupal VM um, and other types of uh, customized Vagrant boxes. Uh, you'll have print R, you'll have DSM, you'll have Kent, you'll have XDebug. Um, but because it's acting more like the actual server, you can generally get things like much more accurate performance profiling. Um, this is if you've ever seen XHProf, um, which was a Facebook product uh, that is a, a profiler for PHP. Uh, it is not going to work anymore uh, after the, the 5.0 branch. Um, so there are two new entrants into the field, uh, Blackfire and Tidewater. Um, so they are both open source projects that you can install and use freely, but also paid services. Um, so if you've ever used New Relic, um, this is like New Relic, but you can do it locally. Um, and it will work uh, you know, on your machine as well as on your local servers. And using this, you can determine things like, oh, I'm dipping into the database 15 times in this one call. Maybe I should think about doing that a better way. Um, you know, you can start thinking, you, you'll be able to start thinking more about things like caching, um, things like you know, optimizing your database calls, um, and you'll be able to see exactly what your code is doing when it's running, which is really nice. Uh, so I promised I would talk some more about xdebug. Um, so what is xdebug? Uh, it is one type of step-through debugging. Step-through debugging is literally hitting pause on your code execution, which is really pretty cool. Um, it lets you inspect the current state of the stack, which is a term you might have heard. Um, and very interestingly, it lets you modify values live which is really kind of cool. Um, so what does all of this mean? Uh, so hitting pause on code execution means when you refresh a page and it's loading and it's running the PHP, you can literally pause it at a specific line in your code. And you can see exactly what the execution of that program looks like on the server. Um, the stack refers to, you know, like the diagram we showed with all the different functions uh, that Drupal goes through to get from point A to point B. All of those functions are generally going to live in separate files, 
And as the code execution is going through those different functions, going through those different files, it's literally building up a stack. And the stack is just like the file names and the function names that are involved in the current action. Um, and yeah, so you get to modify values live, which can be really helpful. Um, one of my previous jobs, we were working on uh, an LMS, a learning management system, for a client. And they were having trouble because uh, whenever you went through their, their courses, you were assigned points um, based on how many you had completed. And when you had accumulated enough points, you were able to move on to the next section. And they were finding a few of their customers were getting stuck, and they couldn't figure out why. They're like, well, they did the thing, and then they got stuck. So we started digging into it and digging into it. And in the code, this, it was a, a fairly hairy uh, if-else block. Uh, with, you know, I think it's like 11 or 12 different branches of ifs and else's nested together. And along the way, it's calculating the points. And it's also <coughs> reading from the database to view previous points. And what was, what was occurring was this was running on a cron job. And if you as a user made it through the course too fast, if you made it through the course between cron runs, it wouldn't recalculate until it got to the end. And because of the way that if else tree worked out, you could accidentally go into negative points. And so they were never going to dig out of that hole. So we we're like, that's crazy. How do we figure this out? How do we fix this? Um, and what we started doing was we were running xdebug to watch the execution of this so we could see step by step, if else, if else, what the point totals were. And we discovered there was a branch of the logic that just basically fell into a black hole. It was an unaccounted for uh, part of the equation. And that's when the math got really strange. And so we were able to verify this by, as we're going step by step, modifying the value to a known good value and watching it succeed, then you can see that, okay, the code itself is pretty, is pretty solid. We just have to account for this one branch that's doing a weird thing. Um, and that was pretty cool. It was the, the first time that I'd used xdebug to like, find something really, really hairy, really problematic, and uh, fix the problem, which was really cool. So we've talked about uh, our tools. We've talked about uh, our text editors. We've talked about our environments. Uh, but of course, something is probably broken. Um, something is always broken. <laughs> um, oh, I put this in the wrong place, didn't I? Oh, well. Um, forget I said that. We're going to talk about xdebug one more time. Uh, because now it's time for the ever dangerous live demo. <laughs> let's, see, let's see if we can make this work. Um, so I am going to demonstrate... Uh, <laughs> I am going to demonstrate, uh, this is Chrome, so it's just yellow because I like yellow and canary. Um, this is, do, 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 make, make everything bigger. Uh, well, that, that is the trick, isn't it? So, this is a test wherein we want to find the answer to the question of life, the universe, and everything. We have put together some code, um, and as you can see, uh, and maybe, you know, if you're familiar with the concept, we're getting the wrong answer. This is not the answer to the question of life, the universe, and everything. Um, so we have to figure out why it's broken. Um, so on the right side here, uh, this is the, the web inspector inside of Chrome, which lets you do step-through debugging against JavaScript files <coughs> really easily and really nicely. Um, so up at the top here, we're looking into the, the sample.js file. Here is the main uh, meat of the debugger, and down here is a console where it's going to print some stuff out. Um, so the first thing we want to do, the first thing we want to think about is log files. Um, and right now we don't, it's not logging anything. So let's fix that. Um, so we're going to go into our JavaScript file and we are going to insert some console log statements. So we'll take a look at this JavaScript real quick. Is this good in the back? Cool. Um, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. What we have uh, we have an iterator that is currently set to zero. We have a number of loops that is currently set to seven. Uh, we have the answer to our question, which is currently set to zero. Uh, we're going to uh, go into a do loop. Um, and in the do loop, da, 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 while the iterator is less than the number of loops we've told it to do, it's going to do some math. 
Um, and in this, it is going to do its loops. It is going to add the number seven to the answer. And then we're going to see what happens. So now that we have some logging built in, um, we can refresh this. And over here, uh, there it is. We have our log output. Um, so we can see at each step what our variables are. So we can see that in loop number one, the current answer is seven. That makes sense. Um, loop number two, 14, so on and so forth. And then we get down here, and so this is our final answer that's output, which is 49. And again, we know that's wrong, so what is happening here? What could be wrong? Um, so we are going to set some breakpoints. I'm going to close this. We don't need this guy anymore. And there we go. I've already set two breakpoints, so I'm going to turn them on. And what I am doing here is looking before my logic happens and after my logic happens. And so this is going back to the idea of the black box. When all you know is that stuff goes in and stuff goes out, and you don't know what's happening in the middle, by measuring and inspecting both sides of that, you can sometimes reverse engineer what's happening. So we're going to look before, we're going to look after. Um, and so um, we have the breakpoint. It has now hit the breakpoint for the first time. So right now, what you're seeing, those three question marks, that's the default value in the HTML. Um, so no actual, nothing has changed in the DOM on the left-hand side. So right now it's there. Um, over here, we have our variables. So if I open this up, you can see all of the variables that are currently active on this page. Um, because it's Chrome, because it's JavaScript, there's a lot of them, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, one nice thing is you can set watches. So you can specify which variables you care about, and you can have it just show you those. So now we're watching, we're looking at the answer, we're looking at the loops, we're looking at our iterator. And we're gonna say, resume the execution, and, and it's gonna go until the next breakpoint. And so now, seven, on the right-hand side, our iterator is at one, loops, answer. Okay, cool. Do it again. And it's just gonna bounce between those two breakpoints inside of the do loop until we get to the very end. And so here we are, we've got the wrong answer, we've got the number of loops, and we've got the iterator. So this is one of those classic things, there's the, uh, the old joke, there are only two hard things in computer science, naming things, cache and validation, and off by one errors. And this seems to be a pretty classic case of an off by one error. Something is wrong uh, in one of our, you know, our, our loops number seems like it's doing too many things. So what we're gonna do is we're going to, let that run to the end. We're going to start one more time. And we're gonna, we have to go into this larger list. But we're gonna go down and we're gonna find our loops. And so here we have loops, it's the number seven. We're gonna swap this value out. So this value has been changed in the running application. It has not been changed in the code. But what happens when we run this through, we now have the correct answer. So what we have proven is our logic is sound, but something in the data was wrong. So we corrected the data, we get the correct answer, and now we can know that, okay, this is what we need to change. It's, it's the number of loops. We're doing that too many times. So this is an incredibly simplistic breakdown of what step three debugging is. Um, but this applies to any variable. When you're working in Drupal, you're going to have the global variables available to you, the server variables available to you. Um, any variable that lives within Drupal while it's running is something you can inspect and modify, which is really pretty cool and pretty powerful. Uh, and I will let you know that is the first time that demo has ever worked, because I'm really bad at math. Oh. Okay, so uh, again, something is broken. There we go, that's the right. So what is the first step in debugging? The first step is to relax. And it's hard, I know it goes against your, your nature, but you have to relax. 
I like this quote from DHH. He's the creator of Ruby on Rails, if you don't recognize his name. Um, who here works with nuclear energy, self-driving cars, missile silos, um, medical heart condition machinery, anybody? No? Okay, cool. You can all relax. When something goes wrong on your website, it's going to be okay. Um, I think, you know, there, there are times uh, when you're going to be yelled at stridently by a VP of marketing or a CEO or just your boss because something is broken. And I wouldn't tell them to relax, but just know inside of you that you get to relax because it's a website. Like, generally, the worst thing that might happen is somebody's going to lose a little bit of money. And that's no good. That sucks. But it's not nuclear meltdown. So it's cool. <laughs> so let's relax. Let's remember the knot. Getting mad at the knot isn't going to help. Getting frustrated with the knot isn't going to help. The knot is still going to knot no matter what. So let's break it down. What's broken? Is something not showing up on the website that's supposed to show up? Um, is it new content? Maybe ask, is it actually published? This is a pretty common issue in Drupal uh, because you're able to save things as a draft. Um, and, you know, don't want to point fingers, but maybe a, a certain marketing department um, has decided they have a very important press release that has to go out at a very specific time on a Thursday. And they have pre-written the press release. They have saved it into Drupal, saved it as a draft. They already reported to the CEO that everything is great. Um, they already put out some tweets. And then they go to the web page and realize that it's not showing up. And then they start yelling at you. Um, so always make sure you stop and think about the simple things. Is it actually published? Is the user blocked? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it's old content. Maybe it's something from a Drupal 5 site that was migrated into this current site as a different content type. And that different content type, because it's Drupal, is going to have its own set of permissions. So make sure that it's set, that people can view that content. Maybe it has a different alias, URL alias. It very well might. As always, in marketing, they decide to come up with that um, really catchy... Uh, thing for print, and they forgot. They forget to tell web <laughs> it's that. So you create the page, and you don't. nothing. Not, nothing relies on that URL. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, is something showing up that shouldn't? This can sometimes be more problematic. Um, is like raw HTML and JavaScript dumping out of a WYSIWYG field? I think this is <laughs> another another pretty common thing. Um, so once you've identified what's actually broken other than somebody yelling at you, it's broken, you can stop and you can work from the bottom up. Uh, and one of the first places is the log files. Uh, if you take nothing else away from this talk, I want you to take this away. You should learn how to find your log files before you need your log files. <laughs> um, particularly if you work with various web hosts, um, they're going to put them in different places. Different versions of Linux are going to put them in different places. Um, so make sure that you know where they are and make sure that you can access them. Make sure that you have the appropriate permissions to actually view those logs, because that's going to be very important. It's a little tool called Multitail that I am a super fan of. Um, this is a, it's a Linux Mac, uti Mac utility um, that is like Tail, which is what most people will generally turn to to view their, their log files except that, uh, among other things, it color codes its output. So by default, you pass in a dash C, and every line of output is going to be colored a different color, so you can really easily see the actual movement. You can see, like, oh, this just happened. You don't have to stop and read the timestamp. You can just parse it much more easily by color. Um, the other thing it lets you do, uh, hence the name multi-tail, you can tail multiple files at once which can be really great. Um, when you're working with something like PHP, you're going to have generally a PHP error and an Apache error that are related in some way. 
Um, so you can tail those two files at once, and you can start visually correlating that as soon as somebody goes to this wrong URL, because marketing sent them to the wrong place, then they get this error message. Um, so even if Drupal isn't telling you the correct answer, you'll be able to see it much more easily. Um, I've worked in places where we're using Drupal, uh, but maybe we're using multiple versions of Drupal, multiple installations, and everything is being managed at a higher Apache level um, to rewrite URLs, um, or you know, this subdirectory goes to this site, this subdirectory goes to this site. So you might not be getting the correct answer from the Drupal side of things, but you can pretty easily pick up on it on the log side. Um, now that we know what is broken, where is it broken? Um, generally, this is going to be maybe a custom module. Um, so you've written some code, your coworker has written some code that has caused some kind of problem. Um, maybe it's in the template.php or .theme file, um, or maybe it's in the theme template itself. Um, generally, as a rule, we don't hack core, and we don't hack contrib modules, so if there is a problem, it's going to be in one of these places. But again, we're panicked. People are yelling at us. We've got we to get this fixed. So let's think about the scientific method. I know here in the States, our science education can be spotty. Um, but uh, if you're not familiar, go to Wikipedia. It's not, it's not that hard of a concept. It's just it can be hard to adhere to sometimes, particularly when you're panicked. Um, and this scientific rigor is, I think, the final piece of what I think debugging really is. Um, being methodical, understanding the issue. When you're doing this, you're changing one thing at a time. This can be really hard when things are broken and you just want to start clicking buttons and running Drush commands. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's important if you want to understand the issue and the actual fix for the issue, that you change one thing at a time you test that change, and then you repeat. So this is kind of the, the basics of the scientific method. Um, it's not helpful if you go in and change 19 different permissions and disable a module and run Drush registry rebuild. That may fix the problem, and the site might start working again, but you're not going to know which of those issues uh, actually fix the problem. Um, speaking of rigor. Git is your friend. If you didn't already know, now you know. Um, Git is great. It helps you save your progress as you work. And it helps you recreate your features or your config files as you're working. Um, and in doing so, it helps make your rabbit holes much more manageable as you're working on a problem that you know takes two, three, four hours, eight hours, two days, three days. If you make frequent git commits just for your personal usage you can see what you have changed along the way um git stash is really great can i ask you a question yeah it's talking about best practices and um what do you think are the best types of messages in, in git commits um i think there are two types of git commits there are git commits for other people to read and there are git commits for you to read um, you know, internally, we have pretty strict rules about what goes into a git commit <coughs> message when we're pushing our final product. Um, but up to that point, it's kind of you know what is helpful to you. Um, I think you want to describe like you know what it is that you did um, or what it is fixing. If you're we work off of Jira, and it's really helpful to have the Jira ticket number in a git commit message, um, just so you know why you're doing a thing. Maybe you're keeping your notes in Jira but you're just making git commits, and that way you can correlate the two back and forth. Um, I think one of the best things I've done for myself lately is I've started doing proper git commit messages. So instead of doing the one-line messages, which is what we generally see, you can actually set it up to where that is just a subject line, and then you have a body. And that body can be as much text as you want. For example, I've seen um, just sort of conversational to, to being um, sort of re-entering the changes in the CSS. Yeah. You know, whereas I, I, I don't know what, what's right. I guess it's a team preference. Yeah, that, that's mostly going to be like kind of a workflow thing. 
Um, and yeah, that's like that's more of like the finished product commit. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing, you know, if you're just doing this where you're going step by step and making commits, just to yourself, and that can be whatever is helpful to you. But then and then you can you can squat. Well, you can squash those together into like one or more individual commits, and then you can rewrite the name. You can rewrite the message to make it the, the more proper message. Yeah, that is helpful. Um, but yeah, as you're working, recreate your features, recreate your config files, commit those, make branches as necessary. That's the, one of the great things about Git is you can just make a branch. They're free <coughs> for the most part. Uh, I guess disk space costs something at some point, but for the most part, they're free. And you can try this, try that, try this other thing, and then merge that back in, and then you're on the path. Uh, Git bisect is your friend. Uh, I have uh, only recently become a, become friends with this uh, thanks to uh, uh, Angie Byron, web chick. Um, she, I think it was a, I think it was something on Twitter where she was helping somebody maybe. Um, the trick to Git bisect, uh, which lets you isolate changes between commits, is you have to make a lot of commits. Um, if you have only made a single commit since the last time you branched off of master, it's not going to be able to show you anything. It's, there's nothing to bisect, uh, which I learned the hard way. Um, and so the idea of git bisect is um, using the black magic that is mathematics. Uh, the best way to find a problem between two points is to start in the middle, which, you know, it makes, it makes logical sense when you say it out loud. Um, but, to put it visually, uh, let's imagine we are working in a factory where an assembly line takes teddy bears and turns them into Christmas teddy bears. Uh, this assembly line has 45 uh, different steps along the way where something happens to that teddy bear. Uh, who can guess uh, if you see the jumble of parts at the end and you need to troubleshoot this, where should we first look in this assembly line to find the problem? 22. 22. Or 23. Or 23. Uh, they put 23 in the book. Uh, but again, this is, this is a bisection. This is taking the number, dividing it in half, and looking. And when you do this, you determine whether the problem is before your bisection or after your bisection. And then you take the next half, and then you take the next half, and then you take the next half until finally you find the spot where the actual problem is occurring. Um, so this is, you know, this is one of those kind of, a, kind of advanced Git things, but when it works, it's pretty magical. Um, but the trick is you have to make a lot of commits. Um, you have to have that history before you can bisect anything. Um, who else is your friend? Git diff is your friend. Git diff is great. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of an unsung hero. Uh, it helps you do things like uh, remember to remove your debug statements. This is very important if you're putting DSMs or print Rs in a lot of places. Um, it helps you ensure that you only changed as much as you actually needed to change. Uh, when you're working in Drupal, when you're working in JavaScript files, sometimes you'll have 13 different files open to look at a single thing. And if you're making a change over here and a change over there, and then you're back in your main file and you're ready to make your git commit, you do a git diff and you read through it properly, you might realize that, oh, I didn't need to change that thing over there. Or in our case, we have a lot of automated code styling that runs when we push our code. And if you touch a file that you didn't need to touch, suddenly you've triggered a thousand warnings that you don't want to have to worry about. So it reminds you to go back and undo that thing that you did over there that isn't necessary, and you're only touching as much code as you actually need to change. Um, and I promise this didn't happen at Acquia, huh. but you only commit print our butts to master once. It's really, it's really embarrassing when the client has access to the, to the repo and you're not allowed to force push over top. So, whew, only the once. Git diff is your friend. Uh, there's another tool, git blame. Helps you find your enemies. No, it doesn't help you find your enemies. Git blame is also your friend. Technically, as I like to think of it, git annotate is your friend. 
Um, so for those that don't know, git blame and git annotate are the same command. They're just aliases for each other. Um, annotate is the friendlier way to say it. Unfortunately, it's more letters to type, so nobody ever types it. Uh, but this helps you track down who wrote the offending code in an issue. Uh, it is important that you note that this should not be a witch hunt. This instead should be a chance to find context for the issue. I think it's very common when we're looking at code to say, what idiot did this dumb thing? Why would they ever do this dumb thing? I think it is equally, <laughs> equally common for you to realize that you wrote the code as it is to realize that it's not dumb code, it was just written for a reason you're not thinking about. Um, so when you're working by yourself, you know what happened. You know who to blame immediately. But when you start working on larger and larger teams, um, you know, I work on an international team now. I've, you know, I've got uh, coworkers in Belarus and uh, Slovenia. Uh, Slovenia or Slovakia? Okay. Slovakia. Um, and you know, they're hours ahead, um, and they come at things from a slightly different angle than I do. Um, and my, my uh, coworkers here come at things from different angles than I do. Uh, and it's useful to find out that, oh, Martin's the one that wrote this code. It's weird. I don't understand why he did this. I can go ask Martin, and he can say, oh, I did that because of this. Uh, maybe it's something he threw together in two minutes, and it is dumb code, or maybe it's something where he, like, this is a different technique, or he had to consider some other external factor that I don't have in my head at the time. Um, and so git annotate lets me see who did the thing, why they did the thing, and is it something I need to fix, or do I need to come at it from a different angle to try to figure out the problem? It's pretty good. But everybody's going to type git blame. Just remember, it's not there to blame people. It gets back to your commit message, too, because if you look at that commit message that you see from git blame with that one commit in context, and it may lead you to like a JIRA issue or something else where the discussion happened about why we were doing this. Yeah. That's where I use it. Yeah. Of course, find the D.O issue where 600 people decided that this was the right way to bring <laughs> it. Um, other debugging methods and techniques. Walk away. Like, seriously. Again, if, unless the building is burning, you can generally walk away from a problem, get your mind off of it, let your brain relax, come back to it. Um, talk to a coworker and or a rubber duck. Um, if you're not familiar with the concept of rubber duck debugging, the idea is when you're working on something, it's stuck in your head. You know from beginning to end what's happening, and you can start to get stuck in these loops where you wind up trying the same thing over and over again, and it's not fixing anything. If you have to describe the problem to somebody with no background on the issue, then you're, you have to start at the beginning. And by starting at the beginning and walking through step by step, you'll often run into the thing that you forgot about. And this can be a coworker, it can be a rubber duck, it can be a beer that you're sobbing into, whatever it is, you know, stop, go back to the beginning, say it out loud. Don't just let it echo around in your head, say it out loud. Also, maybe write it down by hand, yeah, like pen and paper. Um, you know, I think uh, a, lot, a lot of times we're like, oh, it's a computer problem. We have to use a computer to fix this problem. Um, but the first, time, the first thing that led me to fix the problem with that learning management system was actually taking a piece of paper, drawing out a grid, and putting all of the if conditions on one side, all of the conditions on this side, and putting a check mark when I knew that that condition had been satisfied. And that's how I was able to discover the one condition that wasn't satisfied. And of course, once you fix the problem, you want to make the future easier for yourself and for others. Um, this is what I, I like to call proactive debugging, copyright pending. This includes uh, writing watchdog logs, whether it's a watchdog or Drupal logger. Um, that way, when you've noticed a thing that happens, but you don't have enough log information for it, write that. Now, the next time it happens, you can go to the log information, and you've provided yourself a very helpful starting point to figure out the issue. Um, related is to use the syslog module. 
Um, by default, Drupal is going to dump your log files into the database, um, which is all well and good, but it's hard to get at that information except through the web interface. If you instead use the syslog module and have it writing to disk, you can use stuff like um, Elastic's Belk stack, B-E-L-K, um, or project products like Logly or Sumo Logic, which allow you to aggregate all of your log files in a single place and do really cool searching and filtering against them. So you can correlate issues like specific error messages to specific times of the day or times of the week, uh, which is super useful. We use Sumo Logic very heavily at Acquia, um, and it's really great. I don't understand it, but it's really great. Um, and of course, if you can, if you have the time, write a test. Um, if you are working in a tested piece of software and you run into a bug, that bug probably exists because there wasn't a test for that specific instance. And so now this is your time to write that test. So hopefully it doesn't get reintroduced. Um, these are our further readings. Um, so The Art of Troubleshooting, that first book, it is a free online ebook that is super great. I highly recommend it. Um, that is where the teddy bear example came from. Um, Debugging, the nine indispensable rules for finding even the most elusive software and hardware problems. It's a terrible name for a book, but it's a really good book. Uh, you should check it out. It's got some really good advice in there. Um, debugging during Drupal development, um, using the PHP Storm debugger, and of course, Maniac McGee. All really good stuff. Um, I have two t-shirts that I am supposed to hand out. Um, so if anybody has a great question or war story they would like to share, now is the time. Thank you very much. I'll ask a leading question. Uh-oh. <laughs> How do you debug things that only happen sporadically or only in production or? Um, so I think the, the first thing you have to do is figure out, you know, what the thing is, whether it's a time, like time is probably one of the worst um, because that can be something that only happens every 24 hours or something that only happens once every 365 days. Um, and the ability to inject variable differences in is really nice, um, whether that's through xdebug or just actually going to the code and just hard coding a certain date that you last saw the problem and see what happens. I hate those. <laughs> I hate those when I'll call up our, our support and they'll say, oh, it's Okay. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be like in a state. Yeah. And, um, and you know, we'll all get a ticket from a staff member, and I won't see that ticket until, you know, 30 minutes later or something. Those are the hardest things when they're, you know, they don't happen consistently. Yeah. T shirt? No, thanks. T shirt? Oh, sure. Any, any other questions? Any other war stories? I can corroborate the uh, start in the middle. Yeah. Um, I used to support a um, design shop, and frequently they would have difficulties exporting their Adobe InDesign page layout document to PDF. It would just not work. And so the solution was to take their eight or 10 page document, I would delete pages five through 10, we'll try it again, and if it worked, then we know one through four, one through five, you know, yeah. so that thing. So that works in different environments. Absolutely. Awesome, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the camp. <laughs>